Uh, it's a grid search. And I, um, I know I have missed the last couple of meetings. So I apologize if I'm saying things that are bringing up things that y'all already discussed. Um, so this is basically how to tune your parameters, right? Um, there's different ways next time we'll have someone else cover iterative search, but grid search is kind of a pretty intuitive way um, of looking at, okay, what are the range of parameters that I'm going to feed to the algorithm so that it can tune? So there's uh, regular, non regular grids. Um, this was kind of interesting to me. I was reading this about the uh, multilayer perceptron model um, neural network. I have basically very little experience with those. I've tried a little bit of neural networks for like auto regressive neural networks, but this is the example they're um, using. But I don't think you need to understand a neural network reasonably well to be able to understand what's going on here. So regular grid is basically each parameter has a corresponding set, right? So it's like using all the combinations of the set if you do a regular grid. Um, and those pairwise or maybe not even pairwise, multi-factor combinations, right? Um, and so non-regular grid, of course, is the opposite. I think the uh, examples they give will probably be enlightening. Okay, so we're kind of deviating away, I think, from the, well, never mind. So there, it's, not, it's, it's not using the Ames data set, is that what you're Yeah, saying, that's, or? yeah, like I said, it's been like over a week since I looked <clears> at this. So I'm trying to be like, oh, what was I, what were we talking about again? Yeah, so they're, they're setting this specification up, right? We've seen this before, classification, um, trace equals zero, I, neural network. I don't remember exactly what that is about. If somebody does know, please, please jump on in. And then we're tuning right here, um, all these different parameters, epochs, penalty, and then hidden units. Oh, there we go. Extra log in the training process. Um, so this function extract parameter set dials, which I assume that y'all looked at a couple weeks ago, um, I'm always finding out about like new specialty functions and tidy models, I feel like when I <laughs> read the book. Um, so basically this shows like the arguments, right? So hidden units, the range is from one to 10. Um, penalty, right? It's log 10 transformation, um, negative 10 to zero. And then we have epochs at the bottom. Okay, so regular grids. Um, these are pretty intuitive, I think. So this handy crossing function, which um, I think I played around with that a week or so ago. It was kind of interesting to see what you can do. Just makes it kind of, I think of it as kind of similar to expand grid. There's like an underscore grid as well, which I have used. So you have these different ranges, like one to three, and then zero to 0 0.1, and then 100 to 200, right? So you can see that, um, we have one and then zero, zero point one, right? And you're kind of expanding it out there as you go along, different, different combinations of the ranges. So uh, the levels um, argument is another way you can specify, right? And um, this is basically like, how many levels do you want? And then ML, recall MLP param is, that's the, um, extra, you're extracting those dials from the specification, right? <clears throat> so here's a like kind of a different way of looking at it. You have, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of allergies going on here. Um, you have just different levels and I'm trying to see here. So it's the number of levels per parameter. Um, you could also take a named vector of values, how many you want, right? Depending on if it differs. So we want three, only two for the others, a penalty and epochs. Uh, fractional factorial designs. Um, they don't really go into that. Anybody have any experience doing that? I'm curious just to perhaps bring in someone else's expertise. Yeah, not, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not saying you should. I was just like, this is not something I know a ton about. I've done a little bit with grid tuning just in some other book clubs, but um, 
this is not uh, something I need to beef up my knowledge about for sure. So, and then we have a little machine with the, it looks like it's in distress there. A uh, little cautionary note about regular grids. They're computationally expensive, right? Um, especially when you got a lot of parameters. Uh, so basically this is interesting. There are many models whose tuning time decreases with a regular grid. So that is, I guess we'll get to, we'll get to that here in uh, a few minutes. How does that work? That's what I'm wondering. Oh, I see there's a chat. Uh, okay. Sorry, Laura, it was me. I, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to make a comment about sure. neural networks and perceptrons. There is a uh, university professor, uh, Jeffrey Hinton, from uh, the University of Toronto, and he does a lot of lecture on perceptrons, neural networks. I, I think, I'm pretty sure I need to confirm, but there's a book back in the 19, late 70s, early 80s, where it was talking about perceptrons as a naming convention, now, neural <laughs> networks as a deep learning or, or yeah. a, uh, AI type system wasn't technically in play yet. The framework was being built going in that That's direction. Right. That's right. Well, yeah, because it's pretty recent. I well, think. I wanted to I wanted to make some references if any of the team or, or somebody in the future wants to read up on the history of the perceptron and, and its its mathematical use within artificial intelligence or deep learning. Um, it is something that's fascinating, very 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 deep and or sorry very vast in its information, but uh, great great points to to put into this. Okay, cool. Yeah, if you uh, find the title of that book, please do put it in the chat because. I, we in the ISLR, I guess, I don't know if you're part of that cohort, Ryan, the co cohort one, but the next chapter we're discussing on, it? yes, it is actually, it's deep uh, learning okay. and neural networks is, like I said, my only experience is, I mean, I played around a little bit years ago with like some autoregressive neural networks, yes. um, which are not often, well, it can be a little unstable for, for time series forecasting. So uh, my boss I, is kind of like, yeah, maybe we won't do that. <laughs> correct. Well, they're either perfect, well, they're not perfect, but they're, they're almost nearly spot on or they are so far outside of the galaxy of actual known yes, information exactly. that they, yeah, no, the, uh, uh, for it's ISLR, one or the other, huh? it is very much <laughs> for ISLR. Um, I've done my best to try and track with everything, but I believe the information is a little more advanced than my current understanding. So therefore I'm trying to be as, uh, low key and not, uh, disruptive as possible. Uh, I'm well, no, I mean, I think I'm in the same boat with you. I yeah. mean, especially as we get into the later part of the book, things, you know, that are not like standard econometric stuff. It sure, there's a lot of, uh, you know, new or much more in-depth information for me as well. So, yeah. I didn't, I didn't want to deter your, your comment. I just wanted to add one more statement. So sure. there's a service called Rattle R, if anybody's dealt with that in the past. It's a package uh, developed by a for-profit commercial business, but it is open source. The Rattle R system is. It's difficult to install into R, but once you have it, it makes building a tree, building a neural network, and just regression in general uh, very easy. Um, in that econometrics class, that was the the professor required us to use that. So, interesting. Um, in my experience with these more advanced analytic platforms that we're discussing right now, that was actually where I got. Or I received that experience. I have not successfully been able to install Rattle R in any <laughs> computer after that. Class. So, at any rate, you almost need a professional to install it. Okay, you do. Interesting. Yep. Okay, so uh, irregular grid. Um, basically, you can use the grid random, which I have not used this one before. So, you just basically specify a size, and you know, it's. I'll just kind of do some random combinations. Um, I'm not sure, let's see, penalty. Okay, so that's log to base 10, I think, which is what we have the other one. Um, so the issue with random grids, right? Uh, you can result, there can be overlapping parameter con combinations, of course, by nature that it's random. Um, the likelihood of good coverage, right, increases with the number of grid values. So you probably want a pretty big grid. Um, so there's a little illustration here about the overlap in the multi-layer perception problem. So they're specifying a size, uh, original equals false, keeps it in log 10 units. It's interesting. Then we have a nice little uh, kind of a scatter plot of sorts here. So I guess what they're saying is there's like a lot of 
was looking at this earlier. Let's see. Yeah, so there's there are um, over lots of overlapping parameter spaces. You look at some of these points, right? And then these are, of course, going to be like these different pairwise combinations of scatter plots. So like penalty hidden units, right? Look, there's a lot of overlap there. Um, so that's kind of a cautionary tale of just generating a small number of points at random. Mm. So yeah, they mentioned space filling designs. Um, I anybody have any experience? That, so Latin hypercubes, maximum entropy designs. Full disclosure, I did not go and look at and read them. Uh, if I had unlimited time, that would have been a good thing. But any so uh, I guess the, then the Latin hypercube. So there's another function, another one of the specialized functions here. Um, again, you kind of similar. And you can see we still have a little bit of overlap, it looks like, um, but not, definitely not as much, right? There's not, there's a little bit more even spacing out of these, uh, these points. So it's a semi-random grid search. Yeah, I guess so. I, I said, I have not read, uh, full disclosure, I haven't read the, the papers, but, um, yeah, maximum entropy. So I just intuitively, I think of that, right, as, as uh, not close to each other, but I'm sure that's a very non-technical, non-accurate no, way of looking at it. Yeah, that sounds sounds good to me. Oh, thank you, Ryan. You put the book in the chat. Okay, cool. Um, hmm. Okay, so evaluating the grid. I'm, I know I'm going a little bit quickly here, but I just want to make sure I can hopefully get through everything by 9.30 my time or whatever hour it is where you all are. Um, so evaluating the grid. Um, so that fit resamples approach we talked about a few weeks ago, right? Mm. So you're, there's gonna be a lot of resampling going on. Um, so this is kind of, we're kind of going into a different direction from the AIMS data. Although I do think we circle back to the AIMS data this chapter, but I might've been reading another chapter. So don't, don't quote me on that. <laughs> Um, so we're going to be looking at cancer uh, research, so imaging um, measurements from breast cancer cells. Lots of correlation between the predictors, right? So we don't need case, so we're taking that off. And then we're doing that, you've seen this before, the V-fold, splitting it into V-folds here, which is 10, of course, is the default number. So we're kind of doing some PCA because of the high correlation right between the predictors, potential for multicollinearity if we just throw in the whole kitchen sink, so to speak. Um, so they make a note here, PCA being very in space, right? Got to watch out for those extreme values. So here's the recipe uh, formulation that we're all used to. Um, so what they're doing here is, right, they're, they're saying, okay, the um, Yo Johnson transformation uh, basically it, it estimates tra transformations to make that distribution more symmetric, and then you normalize after you right transform. Then we do the uh, doing PCA for all the numeric predictors, and then we'll also be our tuning parameter, and then we'll go back and normalize all of those PCA predictors. Okay, so parameter object, right? Um, they're going to have it be a smaller range. Um, not, not sure exactly why. Num comp is a, apparently a narrow range by default. So they set it to 40. Um, the minimum value is zero instead of one. So there's that function again, extract par parameter set dials, which gives those the, the initial parameter dial. Uh, parameter set associated with that workflow. And then we're going to use the update function, put that in. Okay, so now let's go back to our old friend tune grid. Uh, it's so it's similar to the fit resamples. Uh, grid is going to be that integer data frame, right, of those parameter combinations. Uh, parameter info is optional that will allow you to define the parameter ranges. So So same interface, blah, blah, blah. We'll be measuring the uh, area under the curve since we're doing a classification problem, cancer or not. 
And then we have the cell folds, right? Those V folds. And then we're saying the grid, taking those parameters. And then we're saying three levels. Like, and then we're saying, okay, our metric set is going to be this metric set that we defined above, which is that ROC area under the curve. And then we, we print the object here. We have the metrics table, like a list column situation, notes. I don't, I'm not sure what the notes column is for. I guess it's something, there's a warning or some other kind of message, but um, okay. Yeah, I, isn't that right? It captures the notes or the, sorry, the warnings from the outputs that, when, you, that makes when you actually sense. fit it? Yeah, that makes sense. I When I've tried this tune grid before, like a random forest problem, nothing ever showed up on the notes, but maybe it was because it was a pretty simple, you know, yeah. random forest problem. There really wasn't anything to note. <laughs> okay. So. Um, lots of high level convenience functions, right? Auto plot. One of my friends in terms of plotting, um, since my GG plot skills could use uh, some work, I guess. So we see um, different levels are going to be epochs, right? So we had those, remember those three levels we specified. So it just shows 50, 125. Uh, I guess it's like 70, yeah. Um, 75 uh, difference. And then we have the regularization. So different levels here, uh, as you can see, based on the color of the lines. And then we also have the number of components, right? So we also have three levels for that. So it's kind of a nice way of looking at um, how the ROC, right? We want that to be the area under the curve to be higher and how that changes. So it's, it's kind of you have to look at this a little bit and say, okay, what's going on? It's not to me immediately obvious over, oh, this is the best set of parameters. Um, obviously, it seems like uh, the purple, that's purple, I think that is, line tends to get higher um, area under the curve. It, but, it's kind of interesting how the hidden units seem to make it worse in a lot of cases. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, because this is associated with, this, this would be the hidden units, right? So this is a smaller negative 10. Yeah, so then this is, I guess one. this would be the largest amount of, of regularization. Right. It seems to seems to be best, judging by yeah. that. But then, yeah, if, as you increase the hidden units, it seems like in some cases it gets worse. It's, it's wild. Oh. Yeah. OK, um, so the amount of penalization, which is that regularization, I believe, has the largest impact. EPACS doesn't have, right? Um, is it then as Steve just mentioned, uh, that matters when the regularization is low, um, it harms performance. So when you have, sometimes when you're looking at parameters, it's easy to say, oh, this combination is the best. But when you get a lot like this, this uh, show best, or I guess you could say select, be select best would be if you want to actually choose that and save that. Um, so that tells you, okay, we want five, the best one is like five hidden units, right? Um, they give you the top five, I suppose. Penalty is one, epox 50, um, number of components. So, and that's that close to nine, um, point nine, I'm sorry, for the uh, area under the curve. Okay. So the, the number of the components was the PCA output. So does that mean it's not doing if it has zero components, what what does that what does that mean? Yeah, let me Is scroll it, up again. That's a good question. That's strange. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I guess that would be it's just regular old classification, right? Nothing. Uh, all the initial parameters. Number. Yeah, it would be basically. Oh, a shortcut to skip the feature, right? That robot block right above. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Skip, okay. skip the feature extraction. Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically it's just original predictor. So the yeah. whole, however many of them there are. <laughs> so hmm. no scaling, no. I think there would still be normalization, right? And we we had this transformation already before step PCA. Oh, okay. So we did so, Yo Johnson. Yeah. We did so we're saying, do we not want to do any kind of PCA here? Yeah. Zero, right? And then normal, we would still normalize everything again, but this really wouldn't make a difference. I think if you had zero PC, you didn't have any PCA because you're just basically repeating this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that was really helpful. Yeah, no, it, this is, it just, it's his, uh, it's, it's definitely out of my comfort zone. It's good. It's just like, it's uh, pretty cool stuff. So 
And this package definitely makes it, uh, or these packages, the tidy models framework makes it a lot uh, easier for folks like me. So, okay, I think I scrolled too far, my bad. Okay, so we've shown the best. So um, run another grid search, right? So you can kind of iteratively do this process. And they point out that the larger values of the penalty, weight penalty decay, because I don't think we were tuning that um, earlier. So the space filling designs, that's, we referenced that earlier. Um, uh, doing, we're doing a little bit different here with the grid equals 20. I think we had levels before. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so number of components. Uh, this will kind of allow you to see sort of what's going on um, as you vary, right, the number of components, number of epochs, hidden units. There seems to be a downward trend. Um, and it, interestingly, <laughs> as you increase the number of components, um, and then uh, epochs, I don't really see a lot going on. This, I don't know, it's some sort of nonlinear trend. This is somewhat down. There's kind of an outlier down there. Wow. <laughs> Okay, so care should be, yes, a regular grid is not used. Yeah, so we're not, we're not kind of, we're not examining the interaction between these other, the various parameters amongst themselves. Okay, so the penalty parameter, which is, I believe the amount of regularization, experience result in small, better performance, smaller amounts of weight decay. Um, so this is the opposite of the results in the regular grid. Oh God. So then we we do this, um, we select show best again. Um, interestingly, different. yeah, it's different now. So we have different number of how much, how, let's see, now we have 0.594, so smaller penalty, right? Number of components is like 22. 22 I think yeah. earlier it was- Zero. Yep. Um, so I think, to me, this emphasizes that these are all interconnected, right? And it's very hard, especially the more uh, parameters you're tuning to say, you can't just like tweak something and assume it's all gonna, oh, well, I just tweak that. That's not gonna affect anything else. Um, so maybe that's why we, we do uh, grid searches and later on iterative searches, so. Yeah, so evaluate the models over multiple metrics, so different aspects. Um, often it makes sense to choose a slightly suboptimal parameter combination. So simplicity corresponds to larger penalty values and fewer hidden units, right? So a lot fewer, um, which I guess, I don't know, I guess that makes sense, but um, let's see here. So they're suggesting that we should be selecting model two? Um, let's see. Because the penalty is infinitesimal and there's only three hidden units instead of eight and there's fewer PCA components used too. That's true. PC does it, um, does that help sense. with like interpretability later on? Because, you know, otherwise it's a black box more? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I don't know though with neural networks if me, either way it's, right? There's go, if you have a lot of hidden units or not, you're going to, it's going to be uh, yeah. <laughs> kind of complicated. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you think about it here, right? 0. 0.88 versus 0. 0.878. I mean, this is rounding error essentially. Now I get it that perhaps, you know, maybe at depending on what the problem that could be, that difference in, you know, accuracy could be a huge thing, but there's, a you know pretty big difference here in the uh, simplicity factor. So that is an advantage of the number two model. Okay, what time we got? Nine oh five. Um, finalizing the model. So if one of the sets of the models we that we saw via show best we're an attractive final option. We might wish to evaluate how well it does in the test set. 
Um, so tune grid only provides the substrate to choose appropriate tuning parameters. It does not fit a final model, right? So we're using that V fold, those, those folds in the tune grid, not fitting the final model, but we're saying um, this is how we're, we're going to approach the final model. Okay, so you could do manually pick the values that appear appropriate, which maybe is kind of what we were doing before, or use a select best function. And then this is probably one we've all seen before, and we're choosing this metric to select the best. Um, so what was chosen is 5, 1, 50, 0. So I think this one, sorry for all the scrolling, was this one up here, right? That 0.897. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess we, I'm trying to kind of understand the logic here. So we tuned again, uh, or maybe we we use a different, we use a space filling design, but we liked, or I'm sorry, we used the maximum entropy design in this section, but we ended up choosing one from uh, from the regular grid. Grid search, yeah. Yeah, way, so. Okay, uh, where was I? Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so anyways, um, so we've chosen this one, preprocessor model eight. Uh, it's performance competitive. So we look at this, the results of the regular grid plot, 125. So then we, we this is the best. But then we say, okay, the 125 epochs, large amount of penalization has a performance competitive with this option, it's simpler. So it's basically penalized logistic regression. So I'm, I guess I'm not really sure what the point of doing this was because we're going to a different one, but whatever. Is there so a select worst? Uh, not, not, that you would, not that you would question. want that one, but uh, I, I, I didn't uh, I don't know the anybody, package, so. anybody more skilled in, in tidy models than myself? Uh, I don't yeah, know if Federica joined or not. Just to know if there was like a wide range of yeah results. Yeah, that would I think be it good. seems like it seems like a lot of times the results are very close. Yeah, very like we were talking about yeah. before, like it's 0. 0.88 versus 0. 0.878. You know, I mean, how much of that is right. just based on the folds, right? That you might have sampling. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that, there's that random assignment to the various folds. So uh I don't know. But yeah, so they go with basically, right, we have, we're not, do, we basically drop the PCA, we're specializing our, I'm sorry, specifying our parameters here manually. And then we're finalizing the workflow, right? You guys have all seen this before. And this is uh, the four recipe steps. Notice the PCA really is not pertinent because we're saying, you know, zero. Um, and then we're going to fit this to the entire training set. There is not a select worse. Oh, there is not. At least Maybe, I could find one it. of us needs to put a request in to Julia. Yeah, so in. <laughs> you, you just sort of backwards, right? I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Max Coon, like, select worse. It's definitely needed. What the worst model? <laughs> yeah, have fun explaining just that. To, that to your to boss, compare. right? <laughs> just to compare, you know, just to compare. I want, the, I want the worst for my baseline. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can, I can show well, off. yeah, I mean, that, that is, a, you always should, it is a good idea to have a naive model, right? To say how much, which isn't quite the same as worst, I guess, select worst, but to say how much better are we doing than the, than just randomly predicting some stuff. Okay, so tools for creating uh, specifications. Use models package. Uh, I was not, I had not heard about this uh, package. Has anyone used the use models package? I am curious. Not. Okay. It's new to me. I've tried yeah. it. Yeah. It was nice because, you know, it gave you a lot of um, like the beginning steps. And the, uh, that was before like I had even looked at tidy models and any oh, kind of. Oh, yeah. Because it allows you like to enter stuff in in an interactive way, right? Like parameters. Yeah. And yes, right. Okay. Um, oh, what were you saying? Oh, sorry. I think there were just some news about it. I'll, I'll find it and put it in the chat. Sure. Thank you. Okay. So we're back to the AIMS data. Um, so it's kind of pretty simple. Use XG Boost. I mean, this this kind of reminds me a lot of, um, okay, thank you, Spella. 
Um, this reminds me a lot of like just the LM function, you know, in terms of the syntax here. Um, okay, so then we get lots of helpful messages, right? So step novel, um, anybody know what step novel exactly? Is that basically saying we're creating dummy variables, okay? I have not looked up that function. Has anybody used step novel before? I haven't. Okay, I need to go look. You know what, I need to make a note to myself to look that up because. Step novel creates yeah, was... a specification of a recipe step that will assign a previously unseen factor level to a new value. Okay. If that makes sense. So it's dealing with, yeah, needing to be numeric, I guess. Yep. Yeah, so it's that kind of encoding there. So your, your dummy variables, yeah. Yep. Okay. So this, so we, we tried this, right? All nominal predictors. This requires the models, to, the predictors to be numeric. Uh, but so this kind of, it gives you a lot of little helpful messages, I guess. So then you one hot encoding, which um, sep ZV. Honestly, I haven't looked up that one. It's like if anyway. there's very, very little uh, var variance, it gets rid of them okay yeah it that creates a specification of a recipe that will remove variables that contain only a single value so okay. a single value yeah. okay well oh, wow. okay so it's really variance. basically yeah. no variance um which makes yeah, sense no variance gets because the, the x's x variables have to vary for you to have a model so that, <laughs> that yeah for sure that's <laughs> i think econo basic kind of econometric stuff right Oh, okay. I was thinking of there's one called N NZV, which is just it's like if you want like a threshold. So yeah, there's there's also an NZV, but then ZV is just yeah, it's just zero like, variance, I guess. Yeah, gotcha. yeah. Now, now that makes I'm sense. Up. All right, cool. Yeah, I feel like there's always something new. I'm learning it's a new special function for tiny yeah. models. So okay. So, so yeah, NZV says remove variables that are highly sparse or unbalanced. Okay kind of like a sparse matrix problem. All kinds um, of step functions. I know. Yeah, you can go crazy. Yeah, that's the tiny models reference. I was poking around there a few weeks ago and it's like, there's just, you can really just dive mm -hmm. in and, and uh, knowing what to search for is also kind of challenging oh, sure. sometimes. Yeah. So, okay, so now we're doing, um, our specifications, right? We're going to tune a whole bunch of stuff. These are various parameters for the XG boost uh, tree, you know, tree function. We're doing regression, right? Predicting, and then the engine is XG boost. I'm not, I guess I'm not sure why, well, I'm not sure why we, we have boost tree up here. I guess we just always need to set an engine. So I'm not exactly sure about that. Because so we're the doing previous that. the previous uh, one was Ranger, right? The the engine for the trees. Oh, that's a good point. I, I didn't know, but I was just I didn't know this boosted tree was XG boost. Which yeah, that was just XG boost or <clears throat> I've heard a lot of... about it on Twitter, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lot of people like it. XG boost. Oh yeah, XG boost. Yeah, I haven't used it. I feel like I know some people in time series are all about like you can do a Rima and XG boost, and I'm like okay, that's kind of all my to do list is saying okay, maybe maybe I can get some better forecast accuracy with that one of these days. Anyways, okay, so um, the workflow, right? We've seen this before. Adding a recipe, adding our workflow, and we have our friendly little tune grid here. Um, so this is. So XG boost resamples equals stop Azure resample objects. Um, I guess I'm not, I'm trying to understand like what is the code is, what is the point of just telling your, is this so like you're building a workflow for somebody else or to remind yourself later? I, I, I'm trying to understand why, what this is about. Anybody have any insight? No. It seems like if you're telling yourself to add your R sample object, wouldn't you just define yeah, it like and then a, add it? <laughs> it's like template code or something. So it, it will just, if you run it, it'll say, 
you have to add this. I think it's oh right. yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. I thought maybe it was like you run it and then it asks you for your R sample object, but actually stop yes. would just literally stop the code running. So yeah. That's why the way I'm yeah, reading it. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I could see if you were trying to build something that could be used by other people, but mm. maybe I'm just not understanding this. Yeah, because most of these are like runnable examples, right? That's uh, yeah. this one. Wow. It would just say add your object, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's for this. Is they should just say it's a template rather than a than right. runnable code. Yeah. Okay, so um, use models package can also be used. So no tuning by setting tune equals false. Interesting. Okay, so I'm not, I think we're, uh, I'm not, it's kind of a, it seemed like a little bit of a detour to me when I was reading through it, because then 13.5, right, we kind of go back to different stuff. So I, I don't know, maybe they just wanted to let people know about this. Um, I'm sure there's some reason I'm not, I'm not uh, understanding in the broader picture. So we're going to finish it up by, um, tools for efficient grid search. And these are like just different tricks and optimizations. Um, Submodel optimization. Um, there are types of models where you can have a single model fit and then you can um, evaluate multiple tuning parameters without refitting. So partially squares, I think those of us who have been in ISLR and probably others of you are familiar with that. So it's like PCA, but you wanna maximize the correlation between the predictors and outcome at the same time, instead of just um, maximizing variation in the predictors. Um, so the number, the tuning parameter, right, similar to PCA is the number of components. Um, you got a set with 100 predictors. You can do what retain can range from one to 50. Um, so a single model can be, can fit, I'm sorry, single model fit can compute predictive values across many values and number of components given the nature of partially squares. So, and then obviously the max is 100 because that's the number of predictors. So just so I understand, you run a PLS and you say you have a hundred, you have a hundred variables. Mm -hmm. You run it with a hundred <clears throat> components and that model, the way it computes, you can remove 10 and have 90 and it's pre-computed so you I, don't have to I believe do it again. so i believe so i i'm trying to remember from when i was reading this uh like eight or so days ago um but yes and i think we'll get into that oh okay uh, sorry no no it's fine you, it's a good question though because when i first with this too it's like okay how does this work uh okay i'm trying to see Mar I multivariate adaptive regression splines. I have not, I not heard of those. Interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So they, the ones that generally fit in this category is boosting models can make predictions across multiple values, right? Depending on the iterations, regularization methods like GLN net, um, depending on, can make simultaneous predictions depending on the amount of regularization. Um, Mars models can add a set of nonlinear features. Um, Anybody have any experience um, doing doing any of these and, and these methods? I, I do not, so I, I'd like to hear from anyone who uh, has used this parameter tuning for these kinds of methods. Yeah, I haven't. Okay. No, I have not either. I guess maybe that's why we're all here, right? <laughs> we're, 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 I was like, well, it. I don't know. Some you know, some some people who are trying to refresh their their uh, knowledge. So uh, the tune package will automatically apply this whenever an applicable model is tuned. So that's kind of nice. Uh, you don't necessarily have to think about it. Okay, so this going back to the cell data, the cancer cell data, um, a C boosted C5.0 classification model. I'm not familiar with that model. I feel like I'm always learning about new models uh, beyond the standard econometrics and various other, other things. So we're using that our handy boost tree function, and then we're going to tune the number of trees engine is C5.0. And then of course classification, cancer or not. You should be in my shoes. You mean there's other models other than a simple linear model? <laughs> <laughs> you know, linear regression is kind of a workhorse, but I do think sometimes people rely on it 
uh, <laughs> maybe a little too much. Uh, so yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've done it. I, I've done it too. I, I we I didn't end up using as I used some univariate methods, but um, yeah, it's everybody everybody likes it because it's interpret it's very interpretable. So okay, so we're doing. Um, uh, tune grid here. So notice we have the formula here, class um, on, regress on everything. And then our resamples is a cell folds. Um, grid is just a data frame trees. We're going from one to 100. Um, and I don't know enough about the C5.0 method to kind of give a, a decent explanation of it. So without submodel optimization, it'll take 62 minutes to resample 100 submodels. With the optimization, uh 100 seconds much much better um basically it's fitting one thousand thousand models right versus 10 models so i'm trying to think about the 10 oh because the cell folds yeah that makes sense so oh because it's tenfold mm -hmm. cross validation okay yeah even this is interesting. Even though we fit the model with and without the submodel prediction trick, this optimization is automatically applied by par step. So I guess that's nice to know. You don't have well, to. If we didn't worry do about it, it, it would do it anyway. Is that what it's saying? Or yeah, and I let me see. So here we have we're basically using the specification and we're defining. Let's. I don't want to scroll up to how much time do we have? I don't have a lot more. Yeah, eight minutes. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if you want to go ahead and get through the rest. Yeah. Before. Maybe let's, if we have time, well, let's go back to that. Mm -hmm. I might, I'll look it up myself. Maybe I'll try to put something in the chat if I have an insight or if anybody else has an insight, please, please do. Um, parallel processing. processing. Yes. I do like some parallel processing is, uh, it's really nice. So, but the method to decrease time, you know, the time uh, in model tuning and grid search. So they show kind of a nested loop here, right? For uh, the resamples and then the unique tuning parameter combinations. So this is kind of pseudo pseudo code here. So predict for the different configurations, pre-process data. Uh, by default, the tune package only parallel parallelizes over resamples as opposed to the two loops. Um, downsides, however, is uh, the speed ups when the process pre-processing is not expensive. I'm trying to think about, so you could basically, yeah, sometimes it's not gonna be expensive, but if you're going through um, that parallelization, it actually can make it slower. And I, I have had, this is not related to anything this, cool or interesting, but in my own work, just doing forecasting, some things it is better to use parallel processing for estimating a bunch of models. Other times I, I was doing something and then I was like, why is it taking so slowly? And I switched to um, Single thread. sequential and it was faster. And okay. I'm not skilled enough in computer science and that kind of stuff to say, okay, this is, I think had to do with the second iteration of models were already had parameters specified. And mm. so there wasn't any kind of search going on, if that makes sense. Um, mm. So it was just a kind of trial and error thing um, I learned. <laughs> so uh, parallel workers is nim limited by the number of resamples. So tenfold cross validation, right? Ten pa parallel workers, even when the computer has more than 10 cores. So this is a really interesting uh, visual and I'm gonna try to talk quickly so that I get to everything. <laughs> um, so you have, for example, operation, this is a model, here's a pre-process in dark blue. So fold five, worker two, and you have different folds, different workers, right? And the elapsed time, um, sometimes it's taking longer um, on the pre-processing, other times shorter, right? And this will, the, the, the tasks will be allocated differently. Um, only model parameters are being tuned. Uh, Pre-processing is conducted once per fold per worker. Um, if there were fewer than five worker processes, some would receive multiple folds. But in this case, it's pretty simple. 
Uh, so the argument you can say parallel over will control if you want to use uh, how the process is executed. If you want to use this appro the approach on above, you would use the resamples. Okay, so uh, alternate scheme combines the loops over resamples and models into a single single loop. So we're doing this kind of crossing, right? And that kind of will allow us to use this single loop because we're we would be doing the crossing in like a nested loop if we hadn't. Um, okay, so we're basically saying for iteration all tasks, we're going to do create analysis, pre-process the data, fit the model, then predict. So the parallelization is now up here. So if we use fivefold cross validation with M, so the loop is executed or five times M iterations. Um, this is the, increases the number of potential workers that could be used, right? Um, we turn a higher number of iterations. Uh, however, though, disadvantages, this is repeated multiple times, right? And this is uh, going, like this pre-processing, for instance, is going to uh, be the same um, for the various iterations. So validation sets is treated as single resample. In this case, parallelization scheme would be best. Does that make sense? Okay, this is kind of interesting. Uh, so we have different folds, right? Um, we have mo more workers right here than folds. So um, again, we have our pre-processing the model. So not, not all worker, basically, each worker has less than five folds, right? And they're working on, you have same work, some different workers working on like the same fold, which is kind of interesting. So this is kind of bad in a way because, <laughs> right? You have different workers working on the same fold. Again, that pre-processing is repeated many times. So I like this visual because I think it kind of illustrates if you're not really into the loop thing, like what's going on? And then if you want to say this, parallel over everything. <laughs> <laughs> so use at your own discretion. Okay, uh, I'll try to see if I can get sucks about this. Um, two, two minutes. Okay, <laughs> I'm going fast. No pressure. Uh, yes, so benchmarking boosted trees, uh, five cro five fold cross validation, 10 candidate models. So we're going a little bit uh, less. Pre-processing, uh, then we could cut the same pre-processing. That seems weird. So we're, okay, so we're doing it three different ways. So the, we're using parallel over everything or just the resamples. So this is the different amount, number of workers, right? Execution time. And then the, the different amount of pre-processing. Um, so as you can see, everything, right? Expensive, lots of time. This is a pretty quick drop off after like five, just the resamples, right? Those, those folds, so that's gonna be the max. Um, light and none, for if you're doing it over everything, this is gonna be a lot of difference. I'm kind of getting the sense that um, there's not a lot of difference between this. So none in the plots below. So the process looks like pre-process the data using the deep plier pipeline is slightly the best one. The recipe maybe is a little bit, a little bit slower. Well, maybe not, maybe I'm just imagining things. Essentially the same, really. Can anybody see any difference between these two? Uh, maybe a little bit like, well, that's very yeah. subtle. Yeah, it was very, very subtle, right? Probably not enough to matter, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, no real computational penalty for doing the pre-processing steps in a recipe. Uh, there's some benefit for using parallel over everything with many cores. Uh, I, imagine, yeah. I imagine if you got a Mac, the new M1 chips probably do very well with it. Yeah. I don't have a Mac. I'm not that cool. <laughs> Maybe someday. <laughs> okay, so let's see. I've got a little bit, a little bit less. Sorry, I'm kind of rushing through this, guys. Um, so this is kind of the speed up versus the number of workers. So kind of very much a one to one. Um, 
and you can see that the number of workers with the speed up kind of tapers off uh, as you go higher up. Oh, somebody put a chat. Got to go see you, Steve. Um, and, yeah, me too, actually. OK, well, <clears throat> hopefully you all, uh, I think, unfortunately, there's still quite a bit more to cover. And this is fairly complex stuff. So I can either um, do, you, do we want to go over this again? Next. Yeah. I, I can, yeah, I can start the, I don't know how long chapter 14 is, but I can kind of go through this at the end of next week. I'm sorry, at the yeah. beginning of next week, um, yeah. if you all want. Yeah, rather than try and rush through it. Yeah, it it's pretty it's pretty complicated stuff, I feel like, as far as um, things we've talked about so far. So probably better to not have me trying to like, yeah, what can I say no in one minute? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sorry I slowed you down. Asked too many no, questions. No, no, the questions are good because it helps to clarify my thoughts. And I, I feel like sometimes I'm like, okay, I have a general idea of what's going on here. But if somebody said like, write a concise explanation, I would really have to to think you know so it's good yeah. good to discuss it cool thanks so much okay. uh, look forward to next week cheers thanks, guys See thank ya. you bye-bye